I think maybe this is the mistake that a lot of leaders make. If you work for a good leader, you're going to keep employees, right? We think, but it's not actually true. Career coach Lauren Gassner Otting. Author Lauren Gassner Otting, the woman redefining success. The only interesting people who I spoke to in 20 years of interviewing people were the ones that took right turns and left turns and U-turns, the one who dropped out. We are so worried that if I change horses, if I change my career, then I'm gonna be perceived as a failure. And I can tell you from this side of the headhunting table, those are the best people ever. Not everybody can do it now. If you want to be an entrepreneur, but you can't do it now, what are the things you can do, right? You can Welcome to another episode of Unlock Your Potential. Jeff Lerner, your host, always so riveted to get to be back with you, having amazing conversations with amazing human beings. Today, we shall not disappoint. We are joined by Laura Gassner Odding. She is an author and an executive coach and has a really interesting story. She's a, a, a yay, a dropout like me, although she made it further. She dropped out of law school. I, I dropped out of high school, but she dropped out of law school to work on the uh, presidential campaign of a little known governor, a guy named Bill Clinton. So she was on uh, Clinton's presidential campaign and ended up becoming a presidential appointee uh, under his administration. And then since then, she's been in the search industry, founded an executive search company, uh, writes books, speaks, goes on big TV shows like Good Morning America and the Today Show. And every now and then, she makes time in her busy schedule to appear on podcasts with low folks like me. So Laura gassner Otting, we're so glad to have you on the show. Welcome. Oh, Jeff, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. No, it's great to have you. Um, I, uh, okay, so let me, let me, let me start with a cheat. If you were interviewing you, where would you start? Oh, gosh. Um, if I were interviewing me, I would probably, uh, I would probably ask how, why on earth I dropped out of law school? I would probably start there. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's start there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I, so when I was in fourth grade, I had a, I had a teacher who said that uh, she goes, you know, Laura, you're a really argumentative young woman. You should probably be a lawyer. Of course, the first thing I said to her was, "You're wrong." <laughs> you know, right. I'm argumentative. But then in my brain, I guess subconsciously. I thought, okay, I should be a lawyer. And this is like back during like LA Law and Ally McBeal and like being like a lady lawyer is really glamorous. So I was like, I'm gonna be a lawyer. And I guess I just created a plan in my brain, first subconsciously and then later consciously to get myself to law school, never actually stopping and asking, do I really wanna go to law school? Now, at the time, I also had this idea that I was gonna be like the first female democratic senator from the great state of Florida. And at that point, most people in elective office were lawyers. So I just kind of put mm -hmm. two and two together and I'm like, I'll be a lady lawyer, like Ellie McBeal. I'll like put the bad guys away and I'll get recruited and I'll run for office and of course I'll win, right? Like I just had this, you know, my 12 year old brain or 14 year old brain. And um, I never really thought about whether or not that was the right decision until I got to law school on the very first day. And I looked around and I was like, I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> I don't want to be here. I don't, I didn't, I, you know, you know, the, the student in all the movies who gets called on on the very first day and they get asked question after question after question until they like collapse in a pile of tears. Like that was me. And I was like, this is terrible. So I did what most, uh, most women do in moments where they find themselves completely miserable in life is I dated the world's worst boyfriend and the world's worst boyfriend had great taste, obviously, in girlfriends, but also in unknown presidential hopefuls. And he was like, I'll give you a ride home from school. I want to stop at this guy's campaign office. He's running for president. And I was like, Governor who? From where? Arkansas? <laughs> Not a chance. Forget about it. But I like this guy. So I followed him into the campaign office. And there in the corner was this little black and white TV with then Governor Bill Clinton giving this impassioned speech about how there's nothing that's wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America, which I still believe today to be true. And he talked about service as a solution, community service in exchange for college tuition. And I was like, that needs to happen. And so I literally like dropped out of law school. I started volunteering on the campaign. About two weeks later, all four principals, Bill and Hill and Alan Tipper, 
all came to Gainesville, Florida. We got 36,000 people to show up for this rally in the middle of nowhere. And the national office was like, who are those volunteers? We should hire them. So I got offered a job being paid all of the ramen soup and idealism I could eat. And I never looked back. That's why I just okay. did law school. <laughs> yeah. It, That's my story. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, well, what I want to credit you for is, you know, that's what I think a lot of that is what you dropped out of law school to do. But why you dropped out of law school is because law school just wasn't your jam. It law just wasn't, wasn't your jam. Your, what you were meant to do. And the reason I say that is because I, I suspect if the Clinton campaign hadn't come along, you would have dropped out for something else, right? It's I not like the Clinton campaign stole you from law school. It's that you didn't hold on very tight to law school because you didn't yeah. really want to be there. Yeah. And to law school's credit, I think it was also expelling me like a foreign object at the same time. Right. So, you know, if law school, if the Clinton campaign hadn't come along, I, I might have found something else. I might have flunked out because I just my my heart wasn't in it. So I wasn't working hard at it. Um, I might have gone into a career of law and hated it and had a midlife crisis and left. Like, it's very clear that I would not have retired from a career in law with 35 years in a bald watch. Like, it was just not well, the place for me. Well, that's why I wanted to make that point is because, you know, I'm always I, I try to always have the conversation with the audience in mind. And I got to think there's a large percentage of the audience that still hasn't dropped out of law school, even though yes. they don't love it. Yes. And law school may, may be uh, they may be in the 32nd year of a career. Obviously, it's a metaphor here. Yes. And they're still doing it, waiting for their Clinton campaign to come sweep them off their feet, thinking, well, as soon as the better deal comes along, then I'll drop out. But like, I, I think that's really inspiring that you that you you didn't wait too long, right? Well, and I mean, what I can goodness. tell you, what I can tell you now is having spent then you know I spent five years in politics and then twenty years in executive search. So I have twenty years of interviewing thousands of people, stewarding them through massive moments of career shift and and life change and organizational disruption. That the most interesting people, actually let me rephrase it. The only interesting people who I spoke to in 20 years of interviewing people were the ones that took right turns and left turns and U turns, the one who dropped out, you know, of the metaphorical law school. We are so worried that if I change horses, if I change my career, if I switch what I'm doing, like people are going to think badly of me, that I'm going to be perceived as a failure. And I can tell you from this side of the headhunting table, those are the best people ever because they're the ones who actually, like, what is that, that, that expression, like a, 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 that you know, if you don't look at your own, like it's not a life well or worth lived. A, I can't remember the 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 phrase, um, but uh, if you do not examine an unexamined life, is not a life well lived. Right. That's it. Sorry, I'll get there eventually. I, like I mentioned, it's been a month since I. Started the podcast. Um, but the people who stop and examine and say, "What am I really doing? And why am I really doing it? And who am I really doing it for?" Those are the ones who are the ones who show up the best at two in the morning when all hell breaks loose and things aren't going well, when your best client quits you, but your worst employee doesn't, right? Like those are the ones, the ones who understand why, because it's it's not really about motivation. Like, can I get motivated every single day to do this thing? It's like, what am I accountable to? Who am I accountable to? What am I accountable for? And that's a really big difference. And I wasn't motivated to be in law school, but I was accountable to this sort of inspiration that I had and the other people on the campaign that also had it. Yeah, I love, I think this is a great, a great place to kind of camp out here for a minute is this idea of there's no like vision of what life is supposed to look like, first of all, and that is particularly in people's careers, non-traditional is code for stands out or gets noticed or it isn't like every other applicant, right? Like I think so many people are so obsessed with checking all the boxes they think they're supposed to check. They end up looking like the 900 other applicants that all check the exact same boxes that they thought they were supposed to check. And I remember reading uh, Jeff Bezos talking about the three things that this was in the earlier days of Amazon when he was, you know, which was sort of known, Amazon's a story that was known of having been built with great people very early. And the things that he looked for in hiring, uh, he had three criteria. And one of them was uh, 
along what dimension is that I do something like well, along what dimension is this person going to is this person a superstar that has nothing to do with their job like he hired somebody once because they were like the national spelling bee champion and and it, he was always trying to bring in people that were like interesting and noteworthy and had done stuff that wasn't germane to the resume requirement and that was one of his secrets of his early success he he says so i think that's interesting yeah, I, so I've got I've got two responses. Um, the first is to that, and then the second is to the the first sentence that you said when you started when you started uh, your 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 answer. Um, I had a client once who ran one of the largest banks in New England, the uh, Citizens Bank. I've been there with Larry Fish, and I was helping him find uh, somebody to run the, the, the sort of to start his family foundation, his family office. And he only wanted to see people who had been college athletes on successful teams. And one time I asked him why, and he said, because those people understand that there is a purpose larger than themselves. They understand that they need to be accountable to other people. They understand what hard work, work looks like. They understand what hard work looks like in the dark when nobody sees it, when there's no recognition to be given, right? It's the same thing, National Spelling Bee Champion. That doesn't just happen by accident. You have to have some sort of internal, intrinsic motivation, but also an understanding of extrinsic realities. And, and he was right. You know, he was absolutely right. It doesn't have to be a college athlete, right? But just there has to be, you have to have a thing, a driver. I have um, two sons. My youngest is about to go to college and the college that he's going to, instead of an interview, they have everybody create a two minute uh, uh, video of sort of who they are and what they do. And my son is, is an artist and he happens to tuft rugs, right? So these are like people who like, they they make these gigantic rugs with these like tufting guns that like shoot the yarn through and he designs yeah. all the projects. And I swear he's into this fancy pantsy Ivy League school because he has a weird hobby that he just picked up because he was interested in it. Not because it came out of school, not because he was getting a grade for it, because he just pursued something intrinsically. I think that makes people interesting. But the the second part of what I want to respond to was the first thing you said, which is that there were, I don't remember the exact words, but you said like there is no traditional definition of like a, like a good career or a good job. I actually disagree. I think there are far too many. And I think that there are far too many who come from our parents, from our friends, from like the success hustle porn, success industrial complex, from our fourth grade teachers, from the Kardashians. They don't come from us. There are too few, like there are like, nobody stops and says, what makes a good job good for you. They just say, well, this is what makes a good job. So like how much money are you going to make? Are you inspired by the leader? What's the mission of the organization? How prestigious will it look on your resume? Like all these things, how much money you're going to make all these things that will motivate somebody at any given time to think about a job, but nobody ever says in high school or college or wherever prioritize that list for what makes the good job good for you at this age and the stage in your life. And so we have this idea of this sort of externally defined traditionally acceptable, successful job, but we don't actually stop and ask ourselves that. And I think that's where the difficulty comes in is that it's, we, we're all walking around trying to fill in all the boxes on everybody else's checkbox list. And then we get there and we're like, okay, all the boxes are full. Why do I feel empty? And I think that's the problem. Yeah. Cause they weren't your boxes. They weren't they were your somebody boxes. else's boxes. And yeah. you cannot, you just can't be insatiably hungry for somebody else's goals, which is why the Jeff Bezos thing makes a lot of sense because he wants to see if somebody's insatiably hungry for something, what does that look like? How does that manifest in their life, in their work, in their family, and you know, in their career? He got he got to see that like I will hire somebody who I who who was you know insatiably hungry for a thing. And it worked, right? Like they were able to mm. work for a thing they cared about. So he, all he had to do was like he doesn't have to build somebody who is 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 a you know is a rocket. He just has to like redirect their you know their their aiming system because they've already got mm -hmm. all the fuel. Yeah, or or give them basically give them something else to aim at that probably pays better than a spelling bee. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, you know, so I you know I spent I spent three years after my last book, Limitless, came out doing with, with an online survey of um, from January 2019 all the way, it's still running today. And it's, you know, 67 questions, 
uh, across four different dimensions of what actually engages people in their work. And so I have 6,000 responses from 74 different countries, every single possible demographic, every sector, every age, every stage, every everything from January 2019 all the way through present. And what came out of that, you know, in addition to a 30 page white paper that, that I wrote about for Harvard Business Review is uh, people want to work for something that feels exciting and interesting to them. And people are more interested in working harder than they're working right now for something that is more interesting to them. And even if they say their boss is a good boss, if they don't think their boss sees that and can find the thing and can help them do the thing that's interesting for them, they'll still leave. Right. So it's not that workers are failing leaders. It's that leaders have to like, even if we've hired a whole bunch of incredible performers, if you don't, as Jeff Bezos did, find the thing that gets them excited, it doesn't matter how much fuel they have. So like as leaders, it's our job to have those conversations with our team to figure out, like, how do I take their raw material and just direct them in the right way? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm curious your take on this. So I, I was on a uh, actually a guest on a podcast this morning. Um, and we got in, we kind of got into the weeds about this. So I'm, I, I'm thinking that I was supposed to bring it to this conversation. And okay. it was like, it was like, how do you help people find their thing? Right. Because mm -hmm. we live in a world that I think this is changing, but I think generally there's been this like, Hey, you should be grateful to have a job. Nobody cares about your thing. You know, for most of human history, like you were, you didn't even have the choice to like go to an office and work in air conditioning and have a 401k and like, you should just be grateful for all that. Right. And so a lot of people have kind of like either not built or just lost the muscle of like, what do I actually care about? What am I interested in? What am I, what is my dream? What was I put on this earth to do? Right. And so I'm curious, you know, you're talking about it kind of from the other side of like employers helping, you know, giving people their thing that they're interested in. But like, I feel like a lot of people aren't really helping themselves get brought their thing because they don't even know what their thing is. And so do you help people figure out like, what's your thing? And yeah. So, how? so, you know, I know that, I know that we, um, that this interview was arranged to talk about wonder hell, but if I may, my last book limitless was actually on exactly this topic. So, um, as I mentioned, I spent 20 years in executive search, and it was my job to call the most successful people on the planet, right? People who were successful and 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 had purpose and were crushing it, like bold-faced people doing bold-faced things. And I had to recruit them away to come work for my clients. And that sounds like a hard job, except I was calling them because they were super happy. But despite all the success, or sorry, I was calling them because they were they were super successful. But despite all the success, they were calling me back because they weren't very happy. And I was fascinated by this question of like, we've all been told that success will equal happiness. Once you're successful, everything will be great, easy, amazing. And what I realized was that the people who I interviewed, who I was able to recruit away, they didn't have consonants. At some point in their life, they decided that they wanted to do a thing and that thing gave them alignment and flow. And then the world around them changed or they had kids or they got divorced or you know whatever. And they found themselves no longer in consonance with what they actually cared about. And so in my last book, Limitless, I write about this idea of consonance where we have alignment, we have flow when what we do matches who we are. And it's made up of four things. The first is calling. Calling is a gravitational force, something that gets you out of bed in the morning, a business you want to build, a, 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 a leader who inspires you, a mission that you love, a family you want to nurture, um, a cause you want to serve, right? Some kind of calling. Then there's connection. Does my work matter? What's in my email box, my calendar, my to-do list? Does the stuff I'm doing on a daily basis get me closer to or farther from that calling? Third is contribution. Connections about the work, contributions all about you. How does this work contribute to the lifestyle that I want to live, the life I'd like to have, the values I want to manifest, the career trajectory that I'm looking for. How does this work contribute to my life? And then the last one is control. How much personal agency do I have to the teams to which I'm assigned, the metrics by which I'm being judged, the, the, the amount of money that my hustle earns me? How much do I control? How much my work connects to the calling and contributes to my life? And at every age and at every stage, we want and need different amounts of each of these things. And what happens is that at some point in the beginning of our career, again, somebody says this makes a good job good, but they never stop and say, where are you right now in your career? And I think if we stop and we say, like, I'm at a point in my career where like, I've got a young family, I need tons of control 
goal, maybe I don't want as much calling right now, but I want a job where I can like go, I can go to the job, I can go home and I don't have to think about it at night. At different parts of your career, you might say, I'm in the money earning stage of my career. I want way more contribution. I'm okay letting go of some of the control. And I on and on, I could give you every different manifestation mm -hmm, of that. Sure. But the idea is that we change throughout our lives and we never stop and reprioritize that list of what makes the good job good for us. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm I hear the like, we should just be grateful for the jobs that we have, but I I I don't I I I think that's settling and I'm not a I'm not a gal that likes to settle. Like I think it's worth saying there are a lot of different jobs out there. There are a lot of different ways to be in the world out there. What's going to make this the right job for you? Because if it's the right job for you, you will excel in the job. But it has to be something that is fulfilling what you need, what gives you consonants right now at this age and at this life stage. So uh, it was calling, connection, contribution, and control. Right? Yes. I was scrambling to get my notes app pulled up while we were talking so I could take notes because that was that's gold. I, I love anything alliterative and like mnemonic. I, I love. I mean, I'm in personal development, so of course I all have to start with the same thing. Um, you know, there was one point where it was like, if you have enough calling, connection, contribution, and control, it gets you from chaos, to, you know, and confusion to confidence. I mean, it was like I, there were so many C's I didn't know what to do with myself. I can make it easy for you. That assessment that I talked about is at limitlessassessment.com. So if people want to take yeah. that test, again, it's like, it'll take like 20 minutes. It's kind of an intense assessment. Um, but it, it, the results that you would get will say, here's how much, like, for example, if you don't want any calling at all, like if that's not important to you and you don't have any, awesome. You're in consonants, right? Like you don't have to have all of all four. You just have to have as much as you need right now. So when I was dropping out of law school and joining that presidential campaign, I had all the calling in the world, but I didn't have any control. I mean, were they going to send me to Des Moines or New York City or Little Rock? I don't know. I was getting the coffee for the guy who got the coffee for the guy who got the coffee. So I had no connection, but contribution, I was making no money, but I was manifesting my values. And if this guy won, an interesting career trajectory, right? That worked for me when I was 22, ain't gonna work for me at 52, right? So it's completely different now than it was then. But I think, look, every three to five years or so, we change, the world changes. One of the worst questions I get asked on some of these podcasts is like, what advice would you give your 22 year old self? Like my 22 year old self who's listening on my cell phone to a podcast that was recorded on the internet, like none of those things existed when I was 22. So even if I did know myself, the world around us has changed so much that it doesn't actually matter. So we have to keep examining what matters to us so that we can keep re, you know, prioritizing the way that we show up in the world so that actually feels good. So I, I love you that you've you kind of went where you went i i love this uh sort of malleability of this framework of like you know for everything there is a season right different stages yes. different combinations or weight different weightings of those those inputs and so that's kind of where we went uh on the on this last podcast i was talking about we we were talking a lot about people uh sort of having a a one size fits all thusly dysfunctional relationship with money where like they go online and they're like how to you know what should i do with my money and they pull up some youtube clip of like warren buffett at a berkshire hathaway meeting yeah. talking about his investment strategy and and i'm like that's how warren buffett manages a hundred billion dollars you have like fourteen thousand dollars that you took a decade to save up and you think that the billionaires got relevant investment advice he's in a different phase you may right? have a different so, level of risk aversion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you're not gonna you're not gonna have the life you want if you're as risk averse as a guy that has a hundred billion dollars and his number one goal is just not to lose it, right? Right. And so, so, so I wonder if we can sort of map that that thinking way of thinking over to this like fulfillment concept. Because to your point about being twenty two versus fifty two, you know, uh, one of the what are the challenges? I'm just going to come from I. I don't want to like speak grandly about the world. I'll just say my own experience. I have had multiple consecutive businesses now where I have learned or I have had presented to me a, a reasonably large body of evidence uh, that says young people will use idealism 
as an excuse for what presents like laziness of like, well, like I'll, they'll happily collect. And again, I'm trying not to be like, you know, uh, stereotyping or paint everybody with the same brush. I'm just saying I've had a lot of these experiences where like person who's a year or two out of college thinks that all that matters is that they're safe. They, they show up every day and feel like they're saving the world. And unless they feel that way, they're just going to quietly quit and try to like hide out and get a paycheck without contributing. Right. And it, it, so I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to what is it, what, what does it really take? And this is, this is kind of an opinion. It's not, I'm not asking you to state a fact. I'm asking you to state your belief or your opinion. What do you think it takes or is there a certain set of factors or, or accomplishments or, or character traits that it takes to qualify for the right to do the work that you actually feel called to do? Like, do you have to pay your dues first or can everybody just come out of the gate and go, I want to feel fulfilled every day? Uh, well, that is a, um, uh, that is a great question. Uh, and it's actually one that, that I, that this assessment that I, that I mentioned, I have results on that. Um, and it, because I think what we hear is, oh, well, the millennials, they just want to be rewarded for everything and they want to save the world. And, you know, if you don't make them feel like everything they're doing has all the purpose in the world, they're just going to quit. It turns out from my assessment that actually every generation feels that way. Every generation feels that way. Every generation wants to feel like the work that they're doing matters, wants to feel like they would, um, they want their work to be part of what inspires them to get up every day. It's vital to them to feel important in their work. They want to get excited about the work that they're doing represents who they are. And I can tell you, we have like Gen Z, millennials, Gen Xers, boomers. I'm literally sitting here looking at the results right now. And Gen Z says 97.2%, millennials, 95.3%. Gen X, 95.1%, boomers, 95.6% all say, I want my work to be part of what inspires me to get up every day. Literally the same results across, it's vital for me to feel important in my work. All in the high 80s for I want to get excited because the work you know, says who, like it, it represents who I am. Every generation feels exactly the same way. The difference is, I think, that this, the younger generation today hasn't been told, yeah, we all feel that way too. And it does take some time and let me show you a path about how how we're going to get you there. What the younger generation gets is from boomers and from us a lot of like sit down, shut up, pay your dues. You don't know how hard it was for us. Which you know, who wants to hear that? Right? Who wants to hear that? And right. so the other thing that I have in this report is I can tell you that we asked everybody if they work for a good leader or a bad leader, right? So do you feel like you work for a good leader? People who said like look, we know if you work for a bad leader, you're going to bleed out your employees, right? That's obvious. If you work for a good leader, you're going to keep employees, right? We think, but it's not actually true. People who responded and said, I work for a good leader, but who also said, I don't have a relationship with that leader, even though everybody admires them and they got all the best credentials and you know they're giving speeches everywhere, like they are a quote unquote good leader. If I don't have a relationship with them, they are just as likely to leave as people who report that they have a bad leader. So what does that mean when somebody says, I don't have a good leader? They're saying, um, I don't feel uh, I don't feel like I am empowered to ask for feedback. I don't have agency or influence in about how I work, where I work, when I work. I don't have an understanding of why my work matters in the bigger picture. So what I would say to leaders who are frustrated by the young people of today, right, feeling like they need to like be involved in everything and save the world is they don't necessarily have to be doing those things. They just have to understand a little bit more. They have to have sight lines into why their work matters. They have to understand why you're making the decisions that you're making. And they have to feel like you've got their back and that you understand that this is the path they want to be on, even if they're not like the one right now holding the fire hose, you know, on Maui, right? Like they're the ones who are, who are, who are still there. They, what they're doing actually matters in some way, which I know sounds a little annoying. Like I have to babysit them and I have to communicate even more, but wouldn't you have wanted that too when you were young and when you were early in your career? I know I would have. Well, I think you, I love the point you made. I, I feel like there's, there's two things I took away from that. One is, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to talk about them separately so they don't bleed together and confuse each other. So the first thing I took was this idea of like a, a purpose. And I was thinking like, like they want to, people want to feel like their work matters, but there's, there's two levels to that, or probably to some degree, like 
sub two substitutable options. Either, like you said, I am the one holding the fire hose. I am putting this fire out. I am saving babies. It doesn't matter what organization I'm doing it under the banner of because I am doing work that I that I feel good about. But there's there's a, the uh, the inverse that I, I suspect is to some degree substitutable is like, hey, I may not be the one holding the fire hose, but I'm supporting people who are or I'm a part of something that I really, really believe in. And because when I was thinking about it, one of the things that went through my head as I was asking you that question is I hope nobody I, I, or it's not I hope, but like. Well, yeah, I guess I hope nobody from Entra, like my business that I'm currently involved in day to day, I hope no, but none, because I have a lot of like millennials and and uh, Gen Zers that work at Entra. I hope none of them hear this and think I'm talking about them, because I'm actually not at Entra. I have not experienced. I, I I generally haven't experienced this. It was previous companies where, and, and what I realized is because at Entra we've actually done, I think, a pretty good job of creating a crusade that everybody believes in and they're willing to do some kind of thankless grunt work sometimes because they believe in the thing. So what I would say to organizational leaders, and, and I'm curious your take on this, is that like it's it's always on you. Either help the help your people feel like they're the ones holding the fire hose, or if there's no fire hose to be held, then that then there's a you have to make the organization itself feel like the fire hose. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and you mentioned grunt work. And I think that I think maybe this is the mistake that a lot of leaders make as they say, you know, the young people working here, they just don't want to pay their dues. They want to do grunt work. And it's not that most young people I know are perfectly happy doing all the grunt work in the world. What they don't like is they don't want to feel helpless. They don't want to feel like they lack any agency to affect change. They don't want to feel like they're underpaid and underappreciated. They don't want to feel like they don't like their colleagues, like big surprise there, right? Bad leaders hire sucky employees. No surprise. They don't want to not respect their leader. They don't want to feel like they have to have a side hustle, right? They want to feel like they are their very best versions of themselves at work. They want to feel important. They want to feel like they have agency. They want to feel like they're contributing members. That could be getting the coffee and filing the paperwork and doing some of the bullshit data entry grunt work stuff. It's not that they don't want to do that work. They just want to understand what that work, why it contributes to the larger picture. And yes, of course, they want to do some of the fancier, sexier things, but that could be just as easy as, hey, I'm going to this presentation. Why don't you come along with me? And in the 15 minute car ride on the way back, because on the way there, I'm going to review my notes. <laughs> don't talk to me. But on the 15 minute ride, let's talk a little bit about who you are and what your hopes and dreams are and what your goals are. Like, it's not hard. It's not that they don't like... Leaders, managers shouldn't feel like they need to figure out a way to make the young people's job exciting every single day. They just need to give them, they just they just want to help them not feel helpless, which is what they do when they're working for people who just shove them in a corner and say, pay your dues and, you know, don't talk to me yet. Mm -hmm. Hey there, real quick. I just wanted to let you know, I have been concentrating a lot lately on providing tons of value to my text message community. This could be random thoughts. This could be letting you be the first to know about an event I'm planning or a special I'm running or a free training I'm hosting. Anyway, just shoot me a text to get subscribed. The number is 702-996-3926. Thanks so much. Let's get back to the podcast. Well, I love that. So this this actually brings us to the second thing that I, I said I wasn't going to try to commingle them. The second was that key, that point you made about the relationships. Yes. It is actually really, really refreshing and relieving and and I would say clarifying to hear that a, a great mission is not enough, a great leader is not enough, and a great leader within a great mission is not enough. If people don't feel connected, they will leave. Yes. And yes. I, I'm thinking, I'm putting this right through the lens of my own organization of like, like I want to like talk to our team and say, guys, like. We've got the, like, Entra is a company where everybody's, like, proud of what the flag represents. I I mean, I think I'm a leader that they look up to as the, the CEO and the figurehead, and I think we have a lot of great leaders. But that if we aren't actually building relationships top to bottom, like, top to bottom through and through, because it's not like, like, one of the things that's been really hard for me is as the organization has grown, it's outgrown my ability to have personal relationships with everybody, Right. Like, you know, as soon as our headcount was above, let's say a hundred, like there's people here. I don't, I literally don't, might not even know their names. Although I, I try 
for that not to be the case. So it can't just be on one person to be the relationship guy. Everybody needs to have relationships with everybody directly in their sphere. That's how you create glue and culture. Yeah. And in fact, it's very interesting. I, I wrote a piece for Harvard Business Review right after this, uh, the original version of the study came out, which is that um, it's actually the mid-level managers that are at the most risk. The mid-level managers, because you know you understand what the flag stands for. And the people that you are asking to then translate that into the rest of the team are your mid-level managers. And if they themselves are having a hard time then they're actually not going to be the ones who are who, who are going to pass this message down. So, you know, what in 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 this the survey that we did again, it's six thousand responses from seventy four different countries over the course of three years, before, during, and after the pandemic. So, I feel like it's pretty, you know, it's pretty yeah. good body of work across every single demographic. One thing is abundantly clear, right? Sixty nine percent of workers say they do work that makes them proud, but only 36 percent of workers say that they are working for a leader who inspires them to be their best. Right. Forty percent of people say that they're their best version of themselves at work, but over 98 percent of people say that they want to be their very best version of themselves at work. So it's pretty simple to me is that a leader needs to sit down and talk to his or her people and say, when who are you when you're your very best? What does that look like when you're crushing it, when you're this fundamental state of leadership, when you are, you know, you're, you're, you're closing the deal, you're making it rain. Maybe you're in the back quietly working on a spreadsheet, helping a coworker through a need. Like it can be loud. It could be quiet. It could be public. It could be private. But who are you when you are your very best version of yourself? And how do we bring that person to work every single day? Because people want to be that person and they want to know that you see them and that you want them to be that version. So, you know, look, if you hired a mild-mannered introverted accountant to be your boisterous extroverted head of sales, their very best is not the right version. You've mishired, right? But if you want that salesperson or that that accountant to be the best, very best version of them, then great. Ask them who that person is and tell them that you see them and you love that version of them and you want that version more, right? How do you bring that person out? And that's how you start building that relationship and bringing them to the front. Yeah. So two things I'm thinking. One is I feel like there's probably a real people strategy to this in terms of sort of optimizing organizations to facilitate these types of 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 dialogues. Because frankly, like, you know, one manager with like 27 direct reports is not going to be able to do that level of nurturing. Right. So there's probably some like organizational strategy around right right sizing or maybe like right ratioing mm-hmm. you know managers and reports um actually let's start there because I forgot the second thing and it'll come back to me let's start there do you have any guidance you you can kind of give like let's even just me right as a CEO of an organization you know our head counts between 100 150 people um What's kind of the right ratio to allow managers? I, I remembered the second thing, by the way. But what's the right ratio to to support managers in in being able to nurture people that way? Do you have a sense of that? I I don't I don't know that that's my area of expertise on sort of what the right ratio number would be. I think it depends on what else is on your what else is on your dance card. You know, when I ran my company, ninety percent of my job was making it rain. Right, going out there and yeah. like selling for the company, like representing. And the other 10% was really, uh, well, I guess I would say 75% was making it rain. And then there was like 20% that was really sort of setting culture and tone and sort of where we're going, visioning for the future. And then 5% was like shining sunshine on my people. Like, hey, I saw Lisa did a great job doing this. And wow, wasn't Adele a star for that? And like sending out the weekly email, telling everybody they're stars. My business partner, 90% of her job was like, Oh, little Johnny has an ear infection. She can't come to work today. Let me let's re, you know, organize everybody's right. stuff. Like she loved that. She loved the people managing and the continuous quality improvement and the KPIs and all those things. And eh, I was a terrible manager. I was an abusive manager. I was terrible. I was awful. Like it was not my thing. I was a great leader, but I was a bad manager. She was a terrible leader, but she was a great manager. Right. So like. I think it depends on what else is on your dance card and and what are the key relationships you have to have. Now, if you have one or two or five incredibly key relationships and then they have relationships each with right. 10 or 15 people that are good because that's their job to have those relationships. And then I think that's fine. But I think it really is individually individual, um, 
Yeah, I don't know that yeah, I can so, give you a specific number. So maybe the better the better calculus is to say like can you survey your organization top to bottom and say okay everybody's well taken care of. Yeah. Well, you could give if your so, whole organization then, my assessment and you could have the results and you could know yeah. exactly who's happy. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I mean. Like in your case, you're like, hey, it's okay that I'm not doing this because I'm partnered with someone that is doing this yes. and everybody's well taken care of, right? And as long as the answer to that is yes, then then great. Um, I do uh I'm getting I'm getting too too tactical here. So I don't I don't want to make this just like a consulting session for for Jeff. So um So like, here's what thing- I can tell you. I can tell you this. Okay. I can tell you that 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 middle managers who are the ones who are responsible for setting and spreading corporate cultures and and, and goals, they are the ones through the great resignation, 30 to 45 years old, like these are the ones whose resignation uh, rates rose 20% from 20 to uh, 20 to 2021. So if you're mid-level managers who generally tend to be in the sort of 30 to 30 to 45 year old range, if these are the ones who are doubling down on thinking about exiting, and they are also the ones that are the ones who are most responsible for for sort of setting and spreading your corporate culture. If you are thinking about relationships, I wouldn't worry if, for you, individual consulting for Jeff, but for anybody who's listening, if you have people who work for you, you don't have to have a relationship with everyone, but you have to have a relationship with people who have a relationship with everyone, right? So like everyone right. in the organization has to feel like someone has their back, but doesn't have to be the CEO. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I was saying is like, do, as long as you know, you don't have to be the one taking care of everyone, but you probably ought to know who is taking care. Like for every person, Bingo. you should be able to figure out, okay, who's taking care of this person? Because if the answer is no one, they're probably going to leave, um, is what I'm taking from you. Okay. So, so now let's talk about how we take care of people because, uh, it's fun, you know, I talk a lot about what we don't learn in school and sort of failings of the educational system. And I, and I have a, a you know, a, a vested interest in that conversation because Entra, my platform, is essentially an alternative. It's like an, it's a remedial alternative for adults to get what they didn't get in school when they were younger in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I talk a lot. I study a lot. And I suppose I pontificate a lot about like what's missing from schools. And, you know, you're saying... Hey, the number one thing here is like having those relationships, nurturing those relationships, really caring and supporting people and and having these types of let's call them very soft skills conversations with people. But like we don't teach people how to do that stuff. No. And not only that, we call them soft skills. Right. Like as if they don't really matter. Right. In fact, the soft skills are the most important skills of all. Exactly. And, And I have learned that. Uh, through trial and error and ultimately through therapy and through a lot of personal growth work and stuff that was frankly really painful and messy. It would have been a hell of a lot easier if I had done it earlier and not created all the problems that I ended up in therapy trying to solve just so I could learn what would have created them in the first place or what would have, sorry, avoided them in the first place. So I'm curious, uh, how, do you have any thoughts on like a, a, a remedial approach? Like how do we stop pathologizing, like you said, the softness that's supposedly bad when it's really what's needed. Yeah. So I think that we need to stop pathologizing that. And I think we have to stop pathologizing changing our paths mid-course. Like Mm -hmm. we have, we have so, you know, we have so much at stake with the sort of sunk cost fallacy that like, well, I spent 10 years doing this, right? Like I'm not going to drop out of law school wherever metaphorically it is. So I think we have to stop pathologizing both of those things. But for the for the soft skills, yeah, I, I, I believe that there is increasing amounts of data that show that relationships are the currency of business, right? And that's not my line. Somebody said that I don't know who it is, but it wasn't. It's not me. I'm not not stealing somebody's not stealing somebody's line there. But relationships really are like that's where business happens. Like people aren't. They're not buying your spreadsheet. They're not like when I ran my executive search firm. I used to say to my team all the time, nobody's buying our database. They're not buying our research. They're not buying our interview skills. They're not buying our consulting work. They're buying trust. Like I don't care what you're selling. If you're selling. Mm-hmm pipe fitting, if you're selling, you know, uh, Louis Vuitton, like, I don't care what you're selling. 
you're selling trust. At the end of the day, if people trust you, they'll buy whatever it is that you're offering. But we don't teach people how to build relationships, how to form relationships, how to listen, how to steward, how to ask, how to be grateful. Like we don't teach people those skills. And so much of that, if you don't have that role modeled for you by a parent, by a teacher, by a friend, by a boss, like you just don't see it happen. And I worry a lot you know, like you talk about these sort of remedial skills you don't learn in school. I think that your your business has nothing but upside because people are also not getting those skills when they're not working in an office. Now, I'm not saying everyone should go back to the office, but I'm saying like there are things that there are skills that people are not going to get because they're just not going to see them role model. They're not going to see it happening when they're working remotely in the same way. So I think really continuing to teach how do we show up? How do we listen? When I first started in executive search, I remember one of the vice presidents walked back in one day and I thought like somebody in her family had died. I was like, are you okay? Like what's going on? Like, is everything all right? Cause she just looked like she'd been hit by a bus. And she's like, oh no, I'm fine. I've just been listening all day. I'm tired. And I remember mm. thinking, listening, like how hard is that? And then I learned how to listen. Listen yeah. with my ears, listen with my eyes, listen with my body language, listen with my gut, like really listen to what's being said, what's not being said, how it's being said, the pausing, the the, the, the shift in voice, the eye contact, the lack of eye contact, like all of it. And holy cow, listening is a skill. So I think all of these things that fall under soft skill, this is, it's what separates the good from the great. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And, and you know, for what it's worth in, in our platform. I mean, this is what we have students that are enrolling to basically become entrepreneurs. They're, yeah. we, we support career, different type of career change than you, right? We're, we're, we're helping people leave jobs, not to find a new one, but to go a different path. And we're, this is what I think we're so adamant about is like the success that you want as a business leader or a business owner is not simply about accumulating or acquiring the knowledge of how to do the thing. It's how you do the thing is a lot more important than how to do the thing. And yes. we try to try to try to impart that. But a lot of them are coming from corporate America where they're like kind of skeptical, like, well, that's not how it is at the place I work. You know? Yeah. And also why you do the thing and who you do right. the thing for uh, is also really important. You know, when 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 I write in Limitless about calling, connection, contribution and control, I wrote that because I felt as an entrepreneur, right? Like I left the big marquee search firm and I started my own firm. So I had this moment of rage where I was like, I could do this better, smarter, faster, with more authenticity, more integrity, with more profits for me, with less cost for my clients if I did it this other way. And I remember walking into my boss's office one day and I'm like, man, there's a better way. And he was like, well, man, there's the door, you know, like get the hell out. Like you can stay here and do it our way. We love you, you do great work, please stay. But if you wanna do it your way, well, that's not our way. So you got to go. And when I was sitting in that big marquee firm in my beautiful corner office, looking out over the Boston Commons, I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm not part of the solution for my clients, which leaves me in only one place, which is that I'm part of the problem. And that was untenable. I couldn't stay there. And so I left. And in the beginning of running my own business, I fell into the trap of bigger, better, faster, more. I have to make these numbers. There's a nut. I have to have these metrics. I have to have these dashboards. And that was great. I set up a strategy. I I had key performance index, you know, indicators and all those things. And then I woke up one day and I was like, why? Like, why? I made a certain amount of money. Like I brought in a certain amount of income to my business portfolio at the big firm. Why do I still feel like I need to bring the same amount of money in for my business in my own firm? My costs are lower. My life is different. I want to be able to go pick up my kids at three o'clock in the afternoon or skip work on a Tuesday to go to a soccer game. Like how much is enough? And then I realized that there were sort of two different numbers. There was the want to make number and the need to make number. So the need to make was like, what do I got to do to pay my mortgage, to pay for the kids' school, to you know take a couple of vacations a year, pay for healthcare. And then there's the want to make number, which is like, do I send them to a private school? Am I picking them up in a Hyundai or a Mercedes? No offense to the Hyundai drivers, right? Or But like, am I going on two vacations a year? Am I staying at the two-star resort or the five-star resort, right? Like the difference between the need to make number and the want to make number were all the puts and takes and the sacrifices I was willing or not willing to make in my life, right? So like maybe I missed the Tuesday soccer game, but I take my kids on a vacation to the five-star resort, right? Like that's the difference. And I didn't get to have 
all of those variables in my corporate life because somebody else was right. dictating what my goals were. And when suddenly I was an entrepreneur and I was on my own, I realized that I spent the first few years still operating as if I was in a big company. And really, I had a completely different playground. And I was I could go on different rides. I could do anything I wanted to do. And that was in some ways super liberating, but also much, much harder until I figured out like what life I really wanted. I sat down with a business coach. So the last thing I'll say, I sat down with a business coach who um, asked me how I paid myself. And I had brought, you know, like, the marketing plan and the PL and the prospectus and all the like the, the the organizational, you know, I had like 25 people who worked for me. Like I had like all this, I was expecting all the gold stars. Mm. He looked at me and he was like, So how do you pay yourself? And I was like, uh, well, I mean, he like pushed all the papers aside. How do you pay yourself? And I'm like, well, I got I take in money from my clients and then I I pay my people and I uh I I reinvest in our CRM and some uh yeah, I don't know, website and maybe I put some money away from a for rainy day. And then I, I paid myself what's left over. And he was like, oh, no. I think his exact words are, stop being such a girl. <laughs> I was like, okay, first of all, offensive. Second of all, okay, fine. What do I do? And he asked me to make a list of like, what do I want my life to look like? Questions like not just, do you want to go on vacation, but two-star hotel or five-star resort? And do you want to, you know, be involved in your community? Are you cleaning up the park by yourself or are you like giving $100,000 to build a new park? Like, what do you want your life to look like? He goes, what does that life cost? Now, how do you build a business that throws off that amount of money? And it was a completely different way to think about being an entrepreneur than I had spent in the first five years of being an entrepreneur, which is just like, work as hard as I can, as fast as I can, as much as I can, make as much money as I can and just like, see what happens, right? To like, mm-hmm. oh, what's the actual life that I want? And how do I create a, a business that supports that life? It's like, turned it on its head. Well, th- first of all, I just want to say thank you for beautifully articulating with no prompting uh, the concept I talk about a lot, which is life design. Yes. And I specifically will refer to often in entre- as entrepreneurial life design, that the point of having a business is it's the, it's actually to create a, an engine to install into the chassis of your life that is the right engine for that vehicle. That's right, like, the why point. would you Otherwise, be an entrepreneur if you can't do whatever the hell you wanted? Like, well, why and, would and, you? And, and I would add on to that for most people, I'm not like, I don't want to be prescript, one size fits all prescriptive. Why wouldn't you be an entrepreneur it, unless you have a different way to achieve that, which the vast majority of people don't? That's why I'm that, you know, for me, it's like, I knew very early on I wanted to be an entrepreneur because it was the only chance. Like the entire American economic premise is trading the life you want for security and certainty in some imagined future. Yes. That's really the fundamental premise. Whereas entrepreneurship approached the way you're describing, which you articulated again beautifully, is really an engine for life design. So yes, yes. And if you are going to make a bet, why not bet on yourself, right? Like I know at the end of the day, I'm not going to screw myself. I'm not going to hire somebody else because they're cheaper. I'm not going to send my job overseas, right? Like I know at the end of the day, like I got my back. Like you were a jazz musician. At the end of the day, like nothing's written. You just kind of making it up as you go. Like you have to bet on yourself with every single note. So why wouldn't you bet on yourself. And I understand that like it takes some money in the bank and it takes a little bit of security. It takes like not everybody can do it, but there are a lot of things that a lot no. of us can do that can give no, ourselves. Not a everybody can do it. Not everybody can do it now. Not everybody can do it now. Like I talk a lot about the, in my last book, I talk a lot about the side quest where um there was a day where I was taking my son uh, to to school. I was taking him to school late because uh, he had a dentist appointment and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning already. And I was like kind of cranky. And he was like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I just got a bad night of sleep. And like, I didn't have my you know morning where I'm usually you know creative because I love you and I wanted to take you to the dentist appointment. And right, so like, I'm just, I'm behind on writing. And, and so it's just not gonna be a good day. And he looked at me and he's like, well, just go on a side quest. And I was like, what the hell is a side quest? And he's like, well, you know, like when I'm playing a video game, mom, like, you know, there's a side quest. Like if I'm doing, if I finish the dishes, but my friend Kyle hasn't finished dishes yet and I'm waiting for him to get online, like we want to go to the castle and slay the dragon, like save the princess. But we can't do that until he signs on. 
If I'm sitting here waiting for them to sign on, like I'm a farmer. So I can till my wheat, I can cut it, I can take it to the market, I can sell it in exchange for the wheat. I can buy a sword and potions and a horse so that when Kyle finally finishes the dishes and logs on, I'm ready to go. We can get on the horses, we can go to the castle, we can slay the dragon, we can save the princess. He's like, just do some side quests today. And then tomorrow you can save the princess. And I was like, oh my God, my 12 year old just gave me the greatest life advice ever, right? So if you are if you want to be an entrepreneur, but you can't do it now, what are the things you can do, right? You can take classes at Entra. You can listen to podcasts like this. You can read books like Wonder How and Limitless. Like there are so many things that we can do. You can start saving. Like there's so many things we can do so that when we are ready, when the kids are grown or when, you know, they're in school or when you don't have their, like whatever, right? Whatever the thing is that is stopping you from doing it now, you can do it, but you can just do all the side quests so that when the time comes, boom, horse, castle, dragon, princess, done. Uh, I love that. I'm totally stealing that. <laughs> side quest. Uh, side quest. So uh, you have a new book. I do have uh, a new tell, book. Tell us about it. That's amazing. And then also, uh, you know, if you would share with the the world how they can go get your book and, and find out more about you and follow you and all that good stuff. Uh, okay. So um, my new book is called um, Wonder Hill. And it's... Uh, why success doesn't feel like it should and what to do about it. And Mm -hmm. uh, it is founded from this moment where my last book came out, Limitless, and it was successful. I wasn't expecting anybody to buy it. I had no platform. I didn't know anybody that debuted as a Washington Post bestseller. And I was like, holy crap, now what? I didn't even know I could do that. I wonder how you get to be on the Wall Street Journal. Like I know David at number two, how do you get to be number one, right? I was on the Today Show, how do you get to Good Morning America? And I suddenly had this like, I didn't know I could do that. What else can I do moment? And so Wonder Hell is all about this moment where you've achieved something you never thought was possible. It's exciting. It's amazing. It's humbling. It's wonderful. But also you're filled with anxiety and doubt and uncertainty and imposter syndrome and exhaustion and burnout. It's wonderful, but it's kind of hell. It's wonder hell. And in the book, I talk to a hundred different glass ceiling shatterers, Olympic medalists, startup unicorns, everyday people like us who found themselves in these moments and found their way, not out of it, but through it so that they can understand that on the other side of this wonder hell is just the next one and the next one and the next one. So that's what wonder hell is all about. How do you find me? All my good friends call me LGO. So I am all over the socials at hey LGO from you know TikTok to threads to Facebook to Peloton. I'm, I'm hey LGO. Uh, and if you want to go and take that assessment I talked about, that's at limitlessassessment.com. Uh, but you can also learn more about Wonder Hell at wonderhealth.com. So I think that's that's all of it. I am totally going to go read. Is there an audiobook version of Wonder Hell? The audiobook actually came out just last week. So the Audible, awesome. the Audible available is available on Amazon and Audible and anywhere you get your books. Sweet. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm totally going to read it because I am so relating to that. I feel like I've been through a couple Wonder Hells in the last five years, because which is well, good because it's congratulations. like congratulations through ceilings. Yes, every new level is its new its own wonder hell. So. Every new level has a new devil, and I will say congratulations because wonder hell only presents itself to people who are worthy of it. If you had achieved mm. a, if you achieved a success and there was nothing else inside of you, you wouldn't see that version of what else you could do. So it's it's part of why internal candidates always leave if they don't get the job. Because just the process of interviewing for the job means they literally have to wear the clothes of that role, speak in the voice of that role, think in the mindset of that role. And once they do, they can't unsee it in the same way that every time you see a possibility, you can't unsee it. That's a beautiful note to end on. Uh, Laura, this has been amazing. I'm so glad. This has just been wonder, not even hell. Just not even hell. Just a wonder. Well, you're a great interviewer. Oh, I, I appreciate it. No, this has been a lot of fun. We'll put all those links in the show notes for people. Wonder Hell, new book. Congratulations on all your success. And uh, thanks for being a guest on Unlocked Potential. It's been a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much. It's been great fun, Jeff. And of course, to all you viewers and listeners out there, I'll tell you what I tell you every time. You, not even Laura, you are the best part of this show. You're why I do what I do every single day. And I'm so glad we got to spend this time together. See you on the next one. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. I started with a side hustle that turned into an $80 million business. I was 
really clear on my why. I didn't want to work for somebody else. I didn't want to be told what to do, when to do, or how to do it. I didn't want to be on someone else's time, and I didn't want to be on someone else's dime. I really was done with that. 